This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown, because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there, HRT, in 2015, me and certain liquors don't mix, don't mix well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. Mysterious Circumstances is an American Crimecast production. Remember, everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Hey everybody, this is Justin. Welcome to Mysterious Circumstances Podcast. And we have a pretty awesome episode for you today. It's a very special episode because it is the very first listener co-hosted episode ever. And all the pressure is on my friend Ellie right now. And she's feeling it. She's sweating. Um, But before we introduce her, I just got to acknowledge a couple of of, uh, reviews real quick. Uh like to say thank you to Jeff, says Solid Podcast, and he said he never misses an episode. It's very well researched with cases that uh, haven't been uh, rehashed a million times, and that's pretty much what I like to do. I don't like doing the same shit everybody else does, uh, with the exception of some, some of the bigger cases. Uh, and the next one is another five-star review from... Uh, Twaggly or Twaggle. I don't know how the hell to pronounce that, but just says good show and says they didn't like the podcast at first, but uh, it's uh, made vast improvements and it's what, what they're looking for in a missing person true crime podcast. So thank you very much. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate everybody leaving reviews. And uh, before we get going, I do got to say, and anybody is welcome to follow me on Instagram. Uh, just type in my name. You can find me. We have, the, uh, we have the podcast Facebook page and the group now. There's lots of activity going in. Uh, lots and lots of chitter-chatter in there going on all the time, so it's pretty fun. A lot of us like talking about the same stuff all the time, so that makes it pretty interesting. Um, I am on Twitter. It's at at. M underscore C underscore podcast if you want to follow me on there. Um, just fair, fair warning on uh, Instagram, I do post a lot of uh, inspirational quotes, if you want to call them that, and uh, funny shit for the most part, so pretty random really. But with that being said, I'd like everybody to meet Ellie, who's going to help me out with this episode today. And uh, Ellie, eh, she's all like laughing and shit. Um why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and the uh, and the case we're going to be talking about today. Hi, Justin. Um, just wanted to say, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. It's um, amazing to be the first listener to co-host a show, so it's a real honor. Thank you for that. Um, and today uh, we're going to be discussing the disappearance of Maud Crawford. This was a case that Justin and I together uh, kind of felt that it was unfair that he always had to do a listener suggestion so he picked four cases and I picked this one of the four um so 
Yeah, I think it's a pretty interesting case. Um, it's about a pretty remarkable lady. Um, Very remarkable. Things she accomplished for her time. Yeah, I think, um, so that's kind of what drew me to it. Um, and I've never heard of it before. And I think um, Justin would agree that sometimes it's fun to go over some of the cases that uh, people haven't heard about so much, the ones that aren't maybe quite as famous. So, um, yeah, we decided to go with this one. Definitely, and it was uh, the listener's suggestion was from Eric, who's actually from Camden, Arkansas. So thank you, Eric, for this, and I hope you enjoy your episode. And uh, you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Maud's Maud's background, Ellie? Yeah. So um, Maud Crawford was born on the twenty second of June, eighteen ninety one, uh, which made her sixty five on the second of March, nineteen fifty seven, which was the date of her disappearance. She was born in Greenville, Texas. Um, her mother died when she was only nine, so Maud was raised by her grandmother, Mary Louise Fawcett Ritchie, in Warren, Arkansas. Um, Maud was, I think, pretty much by all accounts, a pretty amazing uh, woman for what she achieved, particularly at that time. Um, you know, the women's rights really weren't as big of a thing as they are now. Um, she was a valedictorian, a valedictorian of her 1911 graduating class, and she went on to attend the University of Arkansas um, for the 1911 to 1912 academic year. Uh, she didn't actually finish her degree there, um, but she instead went on in 1916 to work as a stenographer at a law firm in Camden. Now, um, I didn't actually know what a stenographer was, so I had to look that up, but for anybody that doesn't know, um, it's if you can write in shorthand, uh, which is kind of using symbols or abbreviations or for words or phrases so that you can write very quickly. Um, and it was often used in uh, sort of journalistic fields or for police officers, secretaries, that kind of thing. Um, so that's what Maud did initially at um, Gorgon Law Firm. In 1927, after learning uh, a lot of information about the law, um, Maud took her bar exam at the University of Arkansas School of Law. Not only passed the bar, but she ranked first in her class. She learned, uh, she specialised in management and uh, title work, so estate management and title work uh, being people's wills, shit like that. Um, Maud's admission to the bar was particularly notable because it occurred only 10 years after women were first permitted to practice law in the state of Arkansas. In 1925, Maud married Clyde Falwell Crawford. Um, he was uh, from a prominent family in Arkansas, uh, but the couple had no children. Maud was very prominent in her community. Um, she was the first woman ever to be elected to the Camden City Council. She founded the Arkansas Girl State, which was a counterpart to uh, the more well-known boy state, which permitted high schoolers to learn about state government at the state capital in Little Rock. She was also president of the Business and Professional Women's Foundation, the American Legion Auxiliary, and the Pilot Club International, which was equivalent to the Rotary before the Rotary Club admitted women. She won awards for her contribution to the community, including the Camden Woman of the Year. And she was also selected to go to Little Rock to collect Camden's Achieve Award for Outstanding Community Improvement. So really, she was just, for her time, what she achieved as a woman was really outstanding. Um, and I, I can't think of any other uh, woman of that time period that really quite achieved so much. I honestly don't think there mm -hmm. was. She was she was pretty fucking amazing, to be honest with you. She literally was the elected president of every single woman's civic organization that she was ever a part of. That is pretty fucking stellar <laughs> for her for her time. <laughs> Well, it is. It sort of um, it puts me to shame as a 21st century woman. Uh, I haven't done one tenth of the shit she has, um, <laughs> and I live in a much easier world as a woman. So yeah, yeah, you really do have to take your hat off to her for that. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, one kind of uh, notable uh, thing with um, Maud's work at the law firm, the Gorgon Law Firm, yeah. um, was that in 1939, a former congressman named yes. John L. McClellan yes. became a partner in the firm. 
um, and he was elected to the US Senate in 1942. Now, uh, we'll go into this a little bit more later, but um, yes. at the time of Maud's disappearance, McClellan uh, chaired a high-profile Senate investigation into alleged mobster ties to organized labor. Yes, he did. And I think part of that reason... I mean, we like like Ellie said, we'll get into a little bit more of this later, but the reason uh, Maude got into estate management title work is because in Arkansas, at that point in time, there was petroleum drilling going on all over the place. And at a certain period in the 30s, I can't remember exactly what it was, but there was a, they had literally so many barrels of petroleum that they could not ship them out fast enough. So when it came down to like estate management and title work, there was a lot of people with a shitload of money. And as a lawyer, an estate lawyer, or dealing with title work, you get percentages of that. So being the smart woman that she was, she definitely chose the right field to be making some money. And judging by her house, she did pretty damn good. I, oh yeah, I, I saw the pictures yeah. of her house. It's beautiful. Oh, it? it is freaking awesome. It really is. It's just like straight up 50s style, like it's it's an extremely beautiful house that is for sure um so that was that was kind of all of the background stuff i had on Maud. uh did you want to talk at all about the timeline of the night that she disappeared justin yeah yeah i suppose uh pretty much what i got is that uh Sometime earlier in the evening, her husband left to go to the theater and then later the liquor store, which is a which was a nightly routine for Clyde. Um, and this was March 2nd, 1957. Now, from what we know, she disappeared between the hours of 8.30 and 11 p.m. And the reason we know, uh, Clyde was actually gone before 8.30, but the reason we know it's 8.30 is because um, she had actually made a phone call uh, to her cousin at roughly about 8.30 and uh, Clyde got home at 11 p.m. Now from what I could find and we will definitely go over uh, if Ellie found anything else too is uh, at 11 p.m. Clyde comes home uh, all the lights in the house and outside the house are on uh, the TV is on in the uh, in the sitting room. Maud's purse with uh, 142 dollars in it was sitting on a chair in that room. Let's say after that, um, we had uh, her car in the driveway with the keys in the ignition. So Clyde waits roughly about an hour to an hour and a half, and goes to search for her. Now from what I could find, and Ellie might have find some, found some other stuff, but at about 1 a.m. Uh, Clyde was driving around and actually talked to two police officers uh, out uh, patrolling the streets and uh, asked if there were any car accidents in the area because of the fact that Maud had not returned home yet and figured that she might have uh, left with a friend and been in a car accident or whatnot. And uh, the cops uh, told him there really hadn't been anything going on. So by about 2 a.m., uh, Clyde went to the police station and officially reported her missing. Uh, from there, uh, there was a pretty good there was a pretty good search for her. I mean, like Ellie was saying, this this woman was pretty much, uh, I mean, just absolutely a pillar of the community. She was crazy awesome, pretty much is the only way you can put it. Um, but in all actuality, within about two weeks, uh, the news would actually report that the case was cold and there was no reason to continue the investigation. And, um, Ellie, do you have any insight to that? Do you find anything else? Um, I got, um, just to kind of elaborate on the last point you had, um, the police chief at the time, G.B. Cole, um, I think it was two weeks after the disappearance, told the Camden News that the investigation was stalemated, so not, not very promising, um, no. and in, in 1969, the probate court of Wichita County declared Maud dead, and that she had been dead since the 2nd of March, 1957, as a result of foul play. 
Yep. Um, and I think the the investigation kind of stayed there for a long time until 1986. Um, yes. A writer called Beth Brickell um, wrote an 18 article investigative series for the Arkansas Gazette, and um, I think we'll we'll discuss that a bit more mm. later. But um, that really uh, kind of reignited the case and public interest interest in the case. Oh, it did. It definitely did. I don't know. Uh... Pretty much, I think the only reason she really wanted to reopen the case, and I could be wrong, was because she actually grew up in that area. And I think I would have to say, like every other woman around that area, uh, Maude Crawford was was looked at as you know an inspirational figure. I guess you could say, like a motivation. A lot of people had always like wondered. Model. Yeah, exactly. Just like pretty much the perfect role model. I mean. <laughs> I, like I said, there's in, in that day and age, like there's not that many women that accomplish that much, especially in the South. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, I I actually did um, pick up on one other thing. Um, so uh, the the couple apparently had a dog, and um, when Clyde returned home at approximately eleven eleven thirty p.m., the dog was apparently lying there undisturbed. So. I mean, I, I wasn't able to find out much about the temperament of the dog, whether it was a guard dog, um, but it's quite unusual to me, um, almost, that, that a dog would be lying there so peacefully in such a strange situation. Um, and I know that there's a yeah. famous case, the Springfield 3 case, where um, after yeah. the residents of that house disappeared, the dog was really apparently going crazy, and this dog apparently was completely peaceful nothing in the house was amiss at mm. all, none of her clothes were gone. Um, so it really was quite a strange scene that Clyde would have walked in on. Yeah, and that that raises a couple. Before we get into some some theories and about that 1986 investigation, that, like we were talking a little bit before, like, uh, you know, how nobody really even suspected the husband, but the dog being that yeah. calm because I hadn't heard that I really hadn't heard that and that just brings to light like that it was somebody that knew the dog or somebody that had been around the dog because the Springfield 3 case I am familiar with that and that yeah depending on what kind of dog it was and definitely it's a uh, you know demeanor around the house yeah I mean if it was like a little you know like a fucking Sharpay or something <laughs> you know, it, it probably doesn't care. You know? <laughs> exactly. It's, it's hard to speculate on these things without mm -hmm. having a bit more background information, but I do think it's an interesting point of note. That is a very interesting point of note, actually. Yeah, one of the, yeah, like we were saying earlier, one of the things that got me, too, was just how he, how he approached cops, you know, and asked, just kind of asked about any car wrecks in the area because... Her car was in the driveway with the keys in the ignition, but if that was, you know, the case and she would have left for a friend with a friend, you wouldn't think that she would leave every house in the every light in the house and outside the house, the T V on, with her purse, with cash in it, exactly. sitting on a chair. It just doesn't make and any sense. And the fact that he waited so long. Like if I would have came home and like saw that shit and like nobody was around, <laughs> I would probably and I mean, yeah, there's no cell phones. But I wouldn't have waited like an hour to an hour and a half to go out looking, you know. Exactly. I think you had a really good point there. We were talking a little bit before the show. I mean, what I kind of originally thought was, well, you know, she was obviously very active in her community. She probably had a lot of friends. She probably had a lot going on. So perhaps Clyde came in and thought, oh, she, you know, a friend's come and picked her up and she's out for the evening. But you are absolutely right. Well, if that were the case, would she leave all the lights on? Would she leave the TV blaring? Would she leave her purse at home? And and just for the record, one hundred and forty-two dollars back then now is worth just over twelve hundred dollars. So yes, it you is. know that wasn't a tiny amount to be like leaving lying around. Hell no! I wish I had twelve hundred bucks laying around. Shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, she probably was pretty rich, but still. She, I could definitely imagine, like Ellie had said earlier, her husband's uh, family was actually one of the pioneers of that town. Um, so he was a very, very well-to-do guy, and they were a very well-to-do family, especially. She she didn't just marry into it. She earned that shit. She, 
She was a exactly. very smart I mean, woman. Like, add to that, they were childless too. So yeah, they, they had no really kids. They really had no one spending their money on but themselves. Yeah, yeah, in that badass house they had. But. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. was, um, there was one other point which I thought was quite interesting um, that I read. Um, so after Maud had disappeared, um, Clyde uh, wound up selling the car and it eventually um, ended up in the hands of a person called Don Harrell in um, April of 1957. And he actually found... Um, you said April 1957, right? Yes, Okay. April 1957. So this is, uh, you know, just kind of a month or so after Maud's disappearance. Okay. Um, he found a grocery store receipt underneath the front seat of the car dated... 2nd of March 1957, which was, of course, the day of Maud's disappearance. Yeah. Now, on the back of this receipt was a phone number, um, a Camden phone number. So, on the back of the receipt uh, was a Camden telephone number. Uh, Don Harrell passed the receipt on to Detective Cole, the lead investigator, but rather frustratingly he never heard anything more about it so that was really a dead end right there huh i wish they would have had it did they and they didn't say anything about a time on that receipt huh they they gave a date but they did not give a time no hmm. that's pretty damn interesting especially since it didn't make it, it that far yeah um so i don't know it could be it could be nothing but i thought it was certainly worth mentioning yeah, it is definitely worth mentioning, that's for sure. That's a pretty interesting fact right there, if, if I do say so myself. <laughs> cool. So, do you, do you want to, did you want to jump into theories, or? Well, let's, uh, let's go ahead and shake down this 1986 investigation here. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see, from what I, what I gathered... Uh, in 1986, the case was reopened by, uh, like Ellie had said, uh, a lady named Beth Brickle, and she was an investigative journalist. And in this, uh, it, it was a series of articles in uh, the newspaper that ran for five months long. Um, and she actually implicated a guy named Henry Berg. He was, na he was also known as Mike. Uh, he was a very wealthy businessman in the area, and he was also a former state police commissioner. During the investigation, it was revealed that a guy named Otis Henley, who was a state police detective, uh, had actually found evidence linking Berg to the murder of Maud Crawford. Now, what Henley, Henley had claimed is, uh, before what, what he actually claimed, because I'll be honest with you, I tried writing this shit down and remembering it but it was like so like detailed i couldn't do it <laughs> but after the information i'm about to feed you he was actually removed from the case and uh all his files on this case had actually vanished and what he had found was that uh the first time this is basically the first time any kind of financial motive for the murder of uh, Maud Craw Crawford would have been uncovered. And he found that a deed that was filed in uh, a nearby county in uh, Hope, Arkansas, that had actually transferred timber assets belonging to uh, Rose Newman Berg, which was uh, Mike's elderly aunt. Um, she had actually been declared incompetent in 1955 by the county court. And uh, If I could just jump yeah, in here. Please I do, please do. It. That would be called Alzheimer's disease today. Yes, yes, yeah. it would be. Yeah, <laughs> she was a, uh, she was pretty bad off, and Maud Crawford was her estate attorney, apparently. And uh, old Rose Berg, she was a millionaire. She uh, she was set to leave more than twenty million dollars in nineteen fifties money to three of her nieces, and uh, what happened was. Uh, oh, Mike Berg started transferring all these uh, deeds and all these uh, titles and uh, a lot of, uh, what was it called? Uh, I don't want to say royalties, but it was basically, it pretty much was to a lot of uh, yeah, oil. oil royalties. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it was. Yeah, it was freaking oil rig royalties. And there was actually a couple signatures that were questioned 
by Maud Crawford, and she had apparently confronted him about it. Now, obviously, we don't actually know what happened, um, because unfortunately, uh, by that point in time, pretty much anybody involved with that case uh, had passed away, which is extremely unfortunate, to be honest with you, but... But that, I don't know, when I start looking at cases, I start looking at, uh, you know, motive and opportunity. And I, I'm i not, like, too far gone to to be inclined to think that, that at some point in time, uh, Clyde Crawford, being who he was, probably knew Mike Berg. You know, both of them being pretty high up in the community. I don't know. I suppose with that, we should probably roll into the theories a little bit here. Wow, that was actually um, <laughs> a very interesting connection you made there. I never, I never really kind of thought because I never read that Clyde would have known Mike Berg or, or his family. But that is, that's an interesting point you raise. As as we said earlier, they were Clyde was from a very well known, prominent family in the area, so it is quite possible that he would have been connected to the Berg family. Yeah, or at least at least known Clyde's habits and when he was not going to be at the house, you know. Exactly. Exactly. But anyway, so what's uh what's your what's <laughs> There's only really in all honesty people, there's only probably two or three theories on this. And I would have mm-hmm. to venture to say even three. There's actually only about two of them. But I I would have to say three and we'll go with the probably the I don't want to say the shittiest one first, but <laughs> Clyde Crawford is is one small theory that people have considered because in all actuality, like, his actions after coming home, the time frame, he had a solid alibi every single night, so it wouldn't be too far-fetched to say, oh, well, you know, he was gone. Just coming home with all the lights on, TV on... You know, the dog, obviously, not raising any kind of hell whatsoever. Waiting that long for his wife to come home before he came out looking for her. You know, suggesting to the cops, looking for a car accident. Um, After he knew, obviously, she wasn't driving. But at the same time, she left all her personal personal belongings, including money, uh, at home. Now, that is one theory. Personally... I don't I don't think it holds much ground just because I don't really see a motive for it. I was actually I was completely agreeing with you there. Um there's certainly means for him to have done it or at least have somebody get rid of her. But yeah, yeah I can't see a motive there. I don't think there would have been a financial incentive because I think they were both pretty well off yeah, and I didn't were... read anything about any insurance policies. Yeah. Um and from what I read, they had a very happy marriage. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, in general, Maud seemed to get along with most people. She didn't have any skeletons in her closet, so to speak. So, no. again, yeah, I, I just don't see a motive for it. I don't either. I really don't. I mean, it's, you know, don't get me wrong, some of his actions are weird, but but I just don't see any, any motive for it. And I don't know, uh, you want to... You wanna, maybe take us down the mob theory road, Ellie? <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I think earlier um, I mentioned um, a congressman, uh, John L. McClellan, who um, became a partner at the law firm that Maud worked for. And um, he was, I guess, um, probably quite high up on um, a list of uh, mobsters, people that they wanted to get rid of or at least scare because he was leading quite a high-profile Senate investigation into uh, mob activity within organised labour. Um, now, I guess the kind of an obvious question that springs to my mind is why would um, <clears throat> the mob not come after him directly? I think that's a valid question, but the theory goes um, he was the person that got, got rid of Maud uh, because I guess as a scare tactic to use yeah. against uh, John L. McClellan. Um, I think the police dis- dismissed this theory um, because there was no ransom. Now, personally, that doesn't really mean much to me because 
I, from what I know of organised crime, I don't know that they typically do ask for a ransom. I mean, no. one case that really springs to mind is Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. He disappeared, um, really, without a trace, and there was nobody ever found, there was nobody asking for any ransom money, and this seems like it could be a similar situation. So I wouldn't discount the organised crime aspect to this. I think it is a possibility, but my biggest problem with it is that I don't see why they wouldn't go after him directly. Why they would particularly is not clear to me. Uh, I what do, do you think, Justin? I, I totally agree with that, but the only reason I think they wouldn't go after him directly is because he is way more high profile. And that would bring a lot more attention to them than what they would probably want. So they would probably go for a smaller target. You know, because Maud Crawford was in the spotlight, but this guy was the chairman of a Senate committee hearing, you know, or a Senate committee investigation. Right, yeah. And he if was he a di- senator. Yeah, if he disappears, you, that's automatic feds, man. You know, that's that's the, the government after your ass, as opposed <laughs> to, like, the state cops, you know. That is, that's a really good point that you make. I guess um, the only thing I would say to possibly counter that is, I mean, look at the JFK assassination and RFK. Oh, and, Fidel you know, did that. People, there are a series, <laughs> there are a series that the mobsters are involved in that. So, in all honesty, I, mean, I don't know if that's I, true or not. I but. don't know. I'm, I'm not being a conspiracy theorist here, but, <laughs> oh man, I got a lot of theories on that one, and it, it involves New Orleans mafia and you know traffic. That could be a show. And... We'll want to say, right? <laughs> that would be like a two month long show right there. <laughs> that would be that's that's too much to handle right there, and then <laughs> yeah, but no, the uh, I don't know. Not to go on a tangent here, but you know. Sam Giancana did help uh, old JFK get into office by he did. by doing he did, Joe. Yes. He did he did old Joe Kennedy some favors over there in Chicago because they had to win Illinois the in order to body, become the president. County, I think it was. Yep, and if there was <laughs> if there was anybody that could help uh, control the polls, it was Sam Giancana. Yes, and uh, supposedly uh, the the part of the deal was when he got elected president, the heat would be taken off of the mob. Well, the first thing JFK did was elect his brother attorney general, and the first thing RFK did was start going after the fucking mob. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) not the smartest decision. (laughs) Probably not. It's like, come on, guy, really? You set me up for (laughs) failure, man. And hell, fucking little bro, ruining (laughs) shit. But anyway, um, I, you know, the mob theory is not too bad, but I gotta go with the hen- with the Mike Berg theory because the means, the motive were there. They were just there. I agree. I, I think that the Mike Berg theory is the most compelling because it is an extremely strong financial motive mm-hmm. um, that Mike Berg would have had. And um, Also, um, just one small point, um, obviously Maud was Roseberg's attorney, but she was also her personal guardian, because don't don't forget this woman had Alzheimer's disease, she obviously wasn't in her right mind, so there was probably almost an emotional element of it as well for Maud, where she was that kind of testament to to her good nature and how nice of a person she was. And that she actually uh, had told uh, Mike, uh, sorry, Roseberg's nieces that she would be uh, bringing a lawsuit against Mike Berg. So he not only did he stand to lose this money that he was essentially embezzling from his aunt, but he also stood to be sued and taken to court. So that right there is an extremely strong motive he would have had for getting rid of Maud. And, you know, once she disappeared, surprise, surprise, so did Roseberg's will. So I think that sort of speaks volumes. Yes, it does. And given that it's a small town, it's not not hard to believe that at any point in time, you know what, you know, some of your neighbors might be doing and, you know. Exactly, exactly. I guess one other theory that I feel like we should mention, even though I don't think it's applicable here at all, but I guess it's kind of obligatory whenever you have an adult that goes missing, there's always the possibility that they could have left on their own accord. That is true. I think we have to mention that, but in this case, I think for so many reasons, that's really unlikely. I mean, she would have had no motive to leave. She yeah. was happy in her life. She was settled. And it, even if she was going to leave, would she leave her 
purse with her money in it would she leave <laughs> the tv on would she leave her car with the keys in in the driveway so yeah. i really don't think that that is a viable option here but i feel like we need to mention it because at the end of the day she was an adult that disappeared and adults can voluntarily disappear yes they can and i i agree with that 100 percent. there always is a possibility and um like i listened to a podcast called the the vanished and uh oh i listened to that one too oh my god it's i just got hooked on it i i just joined the facebook group i'm in there commenting and shit and there's actually a case of uh that's from right here what by where i live around fort wayne indiana and uh there's a damn good chance i'm probably gonna do an episode on that because it is freaking phenomenal but you got it you can never you can never take out that theory, I guess, that they left on their own accord. You know, because, exactly. I mean, there's no signs of a struggle. There was nothing broken, you know. Exactly. But, she would have had means, you exactly. know, to get by on her own. Yeah, she she would have. And even though, that you know, there was X amount of dollars in her, in her purse, you know, it's not to say she wasn't shoving some money under her, you know, mattress <laughs> or something, you know, and... Yeah, I imagine she probably had a lot more than $142 to her name at that time for uh -huh. all of her career accomplishments. Uh, I'm pretty sure, given given her career and her husband, yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. they were doing pretty fine. So, but yeah, I <laughs> I don't know personally. I gotta I gotta roll with the Mike Berg theory. It just makes I, makes I the most sense. Yeah. All right. It's it's definitely the most compelling. Um, it I, is. I I wouldn't discount the mobster theory, but I yeah, wouldn't either. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't either. Um, it is a very good theory, and I mean, at first I was a little fifty fifty on it, but the, I think the Mike Berg just had more solid ground to stand on. I suppose you could say. Yeah, and actually, um, you know, just to kind of reiterate what a real piece of work this guy was, he actually. Um, paid off each one of um, Roseberg's nieces uh, that who were actually originally supposed to inherit from her will. He paid them off $187,000 each in exchange for them relinquishing their rights to any yeah. claim on her estate. Yeah. And that I kind of really goes to show what a shady individual he was. <laughs> That's pretty shitty to be <laughs> honest with you, yeah. I mean, yeah, they're, they're probably like, well, at least we're getting something, but at the end of the day... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure without Maud Crawford around, any kind of court case wouldn't have had any ground to stand on. I agree. Unfortunately. I agree. Well, Ellie, I think that pretty much would wrap up the episode. Okay. You're all smiles, so I'm assuming you think you did a good job. I think you did. You did awesome. Um, I'm, I think I'm too <laughs> nervous to comment on that yet, but I guess we shall see. But I, I enjoyed it, so, you know, I'm happy with that. I had a great time. Thank you so much for oh, having me. Oh, no problem. And uh, for those of you who don't know, she is in England, and she is like five hours behind me right now, so she is probably tired <laughs> as shit. <laughs> <laughs> So I appreciate you hanging yeah. out and staying up and all that good stuff. I think it was a pretty good episode. Yeah, I think it was a success. You did a hell of a good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Well, I suppose uh, until then, till the next time, uh, thank you, Ellie, again. I appreciate it. And I imagine I'll talk to you tomorrow. And, uh, you know, I, I'll go ahead and let you know if I lose my job to you or not. Because <laughs> here in about an hour, this is going to be posted, so... We'll oh see. We'll God. see what they say. Okay. I'll, I'll send you some screenshots. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I suppose until next time, then. Like I said, Ellie, thank you again, and you have a good night. And you uh, too. oh, I'll try here and finish some beers. <laughs> but uh, until then, all you listeners out there, I'll see you guys on the flip side. visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi said, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. 
Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth.